As India goes to the polls, what's the future for Muslims, Christians and other minorities if Narendra Modi and the BJP win again? I'm Mehdi Hassan. In the recent Easter Sunday attacks that left hundreds dead across Sri Lanka, reports now suggest at least one of the suicide bombers trained in Syria with ISIL. So is it too dangerous to allow former ISIL fighters who've been in Syria or Iraq or even their family members to return to their home countries? That's our debate. But first, the world's biggest exercise in democracy is underway in India, with more than 900 million eligible voters and 2,000 political parties. Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his right-wing nationalist party, the BJP, are looking to secure another victory. But given the dramatic rise in hate speech and communal violence, why should Indians re-elect Modi for another five years? I'll ask this week's headliner, BJP spokesperson Nalin Kohli. Nalin Kohli, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Uh, India is in the midst of elections, and your party, the BJP, has been in power since 2014, with Narendra Modi as your country's prime minister. But given your term in office has been marked by a nearly 30% rise in communal violence, according to your own government's home ministry figures, why should the people of India, especially people from minority communities, re-elect the BJP? There are two reasons that you would see increase in statistics, and I speak also in as, as an advocate, is that we also encourage greater reporting. For example, sometimes it's said that rapes in India have increased. Simultaneously, you also have reporting, which means encouraging victims to come out and go and report. So that's one part to it. So statistics don't always give you the complete picture. So if you would ask me, as a government, why should minorities, or as a matter of fact, why should any Indian citizen look at voting the BJP back to power and Prime Minister Modi specifically? So my counter question is that show me a single deed of Prime Minister Modi's government that distinguishes between a Hindu, a Muslim, a Christian, a Buddhist, a Jew, or a Parsi, or any other religion that is in India in any way, show us a scheme that is discriminatory in any sense, violates the constitutional principle of equality before law. So therefore, I don't see it. Okay. So basically, charges are made on us, but I don't think our agenda and our work ever shows that. Well, we'll come on to inequality and discrimination in a moment. Just on the attacks, so when the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, warns of increasing harassment and targeting of minorities, in particular Muslims and Dalits, she's just a victim of misreporting, in your view. Well, actually, I personally reject it. I don't hold them in very high regard personally, because I think if they would like to travel a little beyond the confines of their offices, I think they'll have enough work to do in the world that we live in. India is certainly not the place that they need to be focusing on. Well, Indians are focused on what's going on in India. According to a study by India's NDTV network, since your government came to office, the use of hateful and divisive language by top politicians in India has shot up by nearly 500 percent, they say. Your party's president, for example, Amit Shah, recently referred to undocumented Muslim immigrants from Bangladesh as, quote, termites and infiltrators. Are you OK with that kind of basically Nazi-like dehumanizing language? It's the kind of language that's preceded ethnic cleansing and genocide in countries across the world infiltrators, termites? Well, you used multiple questions into one, so let's try and address each one of them. So let's basically look at the analogy of a termite. A termite, essentially, and in India we're used to it because we do have a lot of termites, they come from the ground and they eat you up hollow from inside. And therefore, in India, if you would travel and ask people who live in the northeast of India, which has been inundated by millions of illegal immigrants, we have districts in the state of Assam that no longer have Indian citizens. And when I say Indian citizens, we are including Indian Muslims, too, who, are, who were originally just part on the of language, Assam, you're saying it's fine to call with, people uh, termites in and infiltrators. That's not dehumanizing language. No, I think it's an analogy, and it's a perfectly apt analogy. Because we make four cases when we raise these issues of illegal immigrants. A, we point out that they are a security risk because we've had, in terms of Rohingyas, reports coming of links to terrorist networks. And we have been uh, victims of terrorism for almost uh, three decades, particularly from Pakistan. The second part is in terms of uh, 
draining resources meant for Indian citizens. Indian citizens are including Muslim citizens. And if you are going to have people who are not natural citizens of yours coming in there, and let's look at it. Immigration is a problem that many countries in the West also, in whether it's Europe, whether it's the United States. But, but hold on, President I've got to Trump. jump in there. It's not Let me just use about, a different terminology. It's not just, and Donald Trump has been criticized for racist language, so not the best analogy, maybe. How about the BJP government minister, union minister, Anand Kumar Hegde, who has said, and I quote, as long as there is Islam in the world, there will be terrorism. Until we uproot Islam, we can't remove terrorism. You're OK with that rhetoric? You're OK with him being in government representing no. the BJP? Well, number one, a, I do, uh, I'm in my position to basically say that every individual has a right to articulate their point of view. Agreed. He spoke in his individual we capacity. Agree. Yes, so he that. spoke in his individual capacity. And he has not spoken that in terms of a government policy. Two, you ask me my view, I think I respect every religion. And as far as I see it, I'm concerned about violence in the world, but then I have the greatest respect for Islam as much as I'd have for any other religion. Which is good to so hear. Articulate so as someone who respects difference. Islam and Indian Muslims, how do you feel about a BJP minister saying, until we uproot Islam, we can't remove terrorism? If he had said, until we uproot Hinduism, uh, would you be okay with that? We wouldn't be okay with that. Why are you okay with this? Why no, is he allowed to no, say Nobody would be, uh, no. So why isn't he fired? Well, I'll give you an answer straight on that. Is that if we start looking at it only from the perspective of what BJP says it, then I'd say that you'd first have to do it. If you want to make a case against the BJP, you'll have to look at the performance of every government and the statements and wild statements and crazy statements I mean, coming from a lot of people I, from 1947. As a lawyer, you so know, think, you know so therefore, what as, you're far doing. As, Kohli, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I'm concerned, you're telling me you're giving finish, straight now, answers. Let me finish. Let me finish. But this is what aboutism. No, no. You're saying, what about Congress? What about other people? I'm asking, I'll ask them when sure. they come on my show. I've interviewed Shashi Tour on this show. Happy to ask him all those questions. I'm asking you on behalf of the BJP. You have a minister in government who says, I repeat, until we uproot Islam, we can't remove terrorism. How does he stay in his job after making such an outrageous claim? Well, I think there are three parts to it. So if you ask me, I'll say it also, frankly. Uh, a, if we look at the global terrorist map, there is the misuse of Islam by a large number of people. And I know that Muslims and Muslim countries are concerned with about it too. No, one minute, that's, hang on. That's hang not on. what he said let me with just, respect. Let me, no, no, man, you'll have to hear this because it's uncomfortable. Uh, so let's talk the uncomfortable It's not uncomfortable. We've devoted entire no, shows to ISIS and to Muslim terrorism. Yeah, yeah, but sure. I'm asking so about somebody who so said that until we uproot Islam yes. from the world, you're okay with that? So let me just, no, one minute. You're trying to get an answer from me without letting me complete it. So I will give this it to you. This is the fourth time I've asked a question, but, I'm but okay, go on. Has he spoken after perhaps a, an Islamist uh, terrorist coming and blowing up a few individuals? We face hundreds and thousands of people who have suffered from terrorism. So that context, it may be more in that context. He may be giving a point of view, which may not be what you and I may use the same kind of language. But he's entitled to, under the Constitution, to have a point of view. He is, has a point of view. Interestingly, you mentioned kind of Islamist terrorism. And clearly, Muslims are involved in terrorism around the world. Christians have been involved in terrorism. Jews have been involved in terrorism. And yet your Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, said last month that, quote, nowhere in history have any Hindus been involved in terrorism. That's that's a ridiculous statement to make, isn't it? Of course they have. Well, in the vast majority, if you look that's, at it in terms of I a population ratio. We didn't say vast yeah, majority. No, no, but I'm giving you a straight answer. No, you're not giving yeah, a straight but I'm answer. Giving you a literally straight jumped away and but said no, vast majority. I, he said nowhere in history. Therefore. I'm quoting your prime minister. Nowhere in history yes. have Hindus been involved in terrorism. That's not true. We can both agree on that, right? Well, at least I've not heard of anybody using Hinduism as a religion as a so, basis so, so to not, justify So it. the most famous, probably terrorist in Indian history who murdered Mahatma Gandhi, the right-wing Hindu nationalist Naturam Godse, member of the RSS, the volunteer group that Mr. Modi is also a member of, he's not a Hindu terrorist, mm -hmm. in your view? He's not a Hindu who committed an act of terrorism? No. Well, I mean, I don't know. That, then perhaps you are looking at every murder to be terrorism. That's a new definition. No, I think the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi was an act of terror. I think that's fair to say. It's a murder. Okay. It's as simple. That you're defining it as terror. Okay. I'm looking at it as this. So let's go one by one. How do we define terror? I'm, in fact, this is an interesting Clearly, you define terror as something that no, no, Muslims, Christians, Christians and Jews do. My understanding of terrorism is when an individual, in any capacity, individually or backed up by a group, in any basis, picks up and goes out and kills more than a single individual human being by a bomb blowing themselves up, 
picking up a gun, and that's also an, you know, an act of terror in that sense, because it's terrorizing more okay. than a single human being. Well, A, that's what not what the definition of terrorism that the UN uses, or the US, or the EU. It's not about numbers of people dead, it's about the political objectives. But even if you take your definition of multiple people in 2002... So, okay, let's take your objective. Well, okay, so in 2002, so I'm let's glad take you your definition. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on. Oh, no, 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 I need to ask a question, then you answer. In 2002, in Gujarat, hundreds of people were killed by Hindu nationalist terrorists, were they not? That was hundreds of people killed by Hindu nationalists. I will disagree with you completely. Because you see, on the Gujarat things, I worked on that too. So while everybody looks at, at the best bakery or looks at the Muslims who got killed, why don't we also talk about the Hindus who went out and saved the Muslims? Why don't we talk of the Gujarat police that went into the Nurani well, Masjid and that. ensured? That's like saying, on. Well, that's and like saying we ISIS on? is not a terrorist group because Iraqi police fight them. That's a weird uh, analogy. We, you know that. We're, we're, I'm talking about the people who killed people in Gujarat. Were they not terrorists? Yes or no? Have you finished? So let me put it like this. Uh, number one, you are looking somewhere to make an interesting headline that terrorism is defined in a new way when it comes to look at it at the BJP and India. I'm going to reject that outright. As a political person and as an advocate, I can now count you out all the riots in India, which is the gory part of India's history, starting from 1947, Right no up to no one's, no one's disputing me. No, 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 I'm no, not. No, so there's no hold point, on. There's so one thing we don't, I don't disagree no, no, so with the you about the history. Let's, no, but uh, hang on. What about the Sikh genocide of 84? Again, you're what about, about Hinduism. You're literally saying, what about, what about I'm not Bhagal questioning Bhagal. that. I'm not questioning. So in fact, I began. In fact, I began. So how are they terrorism? No, no, no. Let's stop this. I began by saying Muslims, Jews, Christians, Sikhs all carry out acts of terror. You're the only one saying Hindus are a spectral group. No, you're trying to give every act of violence. No, and I disagree with you. And I will continue to disagree, because you're looking at defining every act of uh, violence as terrorism. Okay. And I'm making a qualified... Well, let's take a specific case, because we're running out of time. Let's take a specific case. Mm. Right now, the sure. BJP has nominated for parliament a radical Hindu nationalist named Pragya Singh Thakur, who is currently on bail facing terror charges under your Indian legal system for her alleged involvement in a 2008 bomb attack that killed six people. Can you point to a governing party anywhere in the democratic world which nominates candidates for office who are on trial? for terrorism. Well, you should have come and attended her hearing in the Honorable Supreme Court, where within that hearing also, in so many years of investigation under different regimes of government, and I'm talking primarily of our opposition party, the Congress party, which framed her, went in and couldn't find an iota of evidence against her. You can't incarcerate a person just because you believe that she may have committed an act of terror. Sorry, I'm, I'm confused. Did it's I, as simple maybe as that. I, maybe She's I'm, out on bail. Maybe I'm mistaken. She's not on trial for terrorism. No, she is. I'm saying so, that. And you're okay with someone saying, who's on trial for terrorism standing in parliament? No. She hasn't been cleared saying, yet. I'm maybe you're also, right. Maybe she was framed. But right now, she's currently on trial for terrorism. And she's running as a candidate for your party. And my answer to that is exactly what I said a moment ago. The Supreme Court is where, finally, she got her bail. On the basic grounds, go read the judgment. Don't ask me. Read the judgment and tell your viewers. So, so hold on, they threw out the case and she's innocent. Is that what you're saying? I never said that. Well, then I you're diverting us bail. from the central point. I'm simply saying that there is not an iota of evidence. The trial, is the trial will eventually, so, as it's happened with another person in the similar case. Dude, so we agree, she's discharged. on trial. You believe she's innocent, but right now she is on trial for terrorism. Um, Nalin Kohli, one final question. Given we've seen this increase sure. in communal violence, the cow vigilante killings, which we didn't have time to discuss, the anti-Muslim rhetoric, which we did discuss, um, your government's even been accused of rewriting history books to take out uh, the, the achievements of Muslim rulers. There's a lot of talk about Hindu nationalism right now on your watch. Is it fair to say that the ultimate goal of a BJP government in the long run is to turn India into a Hindu Rashtra, a Hindu state. Is that the ultimate goal? Constitutionally, India is a country where every religion is given equal rights. All Indian citizens, we are first Indian citizens, then we are Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Buddhists, or whatever thing. That's how it is. The Muslims who stayed back in 1947 chose to make India their land and then through the constitution got rights for themselves as Muslims or Christians or whatever. And so that's not something you support? You don't support a Hindu Rashtra? Well, I mean, let me say it bluntly. Muslims are as much citizens of India as Hindus are. So are Christians, so are Buddhists. So there is no denial of the fact that we are all Indian citizens first. You say, and the constitution you say, gives say us that bluntly, right. But you still don't answer the question. Do you support a Hindu state? Building a Hindu state, yes or no? We are a country that is not theologically, written, uh, theologically run. 
We are a country that runs on the constitution. That's your answer. Pick up the constitution. And the constitution doesn't speak of a Hindu or a Muslim state. Pakistan runs on Islam. India runs but on the constitution. Members of the BJP do talk about a Hindu state. So I'm just wondering, do you, Nalin Kohli, support that call for a Hindu state? Well, that's a 30-minute debate to understand in what context it's used, not to convert India into a theologically driven Hindu state. Unfortunately, we it's don't not. have another 30 minutes. So, Nalin Kohli, thank I you know, for taking time I'm out. Saying. Appreciate you joining me on Upfront. Thank you. More than 250 people were killed on Easter Sunday when eight coordinated bomb blasts tore through multiple sites in Sri Lanka. ISIL claimed responsibility, and according to a new report, at least one of the suicide bombers trained in Syria with the group. And that's reignited the debate in the West over what to do with the thousands of foreign fighters who've been captured, should they be allowed to return home. Earlier, I spoke to Mesa Gifford, a self-styled anti-ISIL campaigner who fought with the Kurdish YPG in Syria, and Jasmine Al-Gamal, former Pentagon official in the Obama administration. I began by asking Jasmine why she believes ISIL fighters should be repatriated back to the US, the UK, and elsewhere. So the alternative to not taking them back, Mehdi, is to leave them where they are right now. And that means leaving some of them under control of the SDF in Syria, which is a non-state actor and has no capacity to handle them. And the other option is to leave the others in Iraq under the capacity or under the jurisdiction of the Iraqi government, which has really shown that it also doesn't have the capacity to try them in a fair or humane manner where um, people are shoved into courtrooms and they have five-minute trials after which which they could be sentenced to death. Um, for those ISIS fighters who are not able to be tried in courts, they're languishing in prisons. They could either escape or, in the meantime, be further radicalized. Neither of those options are good for the West. Mesa, what's wrong with bringing them back to their home countries where they were born and raised, where they have citizenship, and trying them? I actually disagree with Jasmine that uh, one of the options on the table that the SDF has already declared is that they're willing to create an international court in Syria or perhaps on the Syrian-Iraqi border to try all uh, Islamic State fighters and their supporters. Um, at the moment, they remain a huge threat to the West. They've been ideologically uh, indoctrinated since their arrival in, uh, in the area. They've been receiving a huge amount of military training. And we simply can't take the risk of allowing these people hundreds of well-trained jihadis to flood back into the West, uh, back into Britain, back into Europe, back into America, uh, and potentially cause another uh, terrorist act. But Mesa, not all of them are quote-unquote jihadis or, or terrorists or fighters. Uh, we read a lot uh, these days in the papers about the quote-unquote ISIL brides, uh, young women uh, who went out for whatever reason, um, and no one's defending why they went out, but go and get married, have kids, and now realize they made an epic, epic mistake, may have committed crimes too, but not terrorist acts, and want to come home and, and face, you know, face the music. How can you be opposed to that? No, I disagree. They, um, they, the women are just as culpable as the men. Uh, many of them, uh, women fought alongside ISIS fighters on the front line. There's uh, evidence even of this young lady, for instance, Shamima Begum, of her stitching suicide vests onto Islamic State uh, fighters. Um, these people are well trained. They're as much of, part of a part of the Islamic State machinery as the men. And allowing them back into the, into the West is incredibly dangerous. Take one ex example. Salman Abedi, uh, a young man that spent time in Libya, whose father and brother was fighting in Libya. Uh, he came, was allowed to come back to this country, where he detonated a suicide vest in Manchester Arena, killing uh, dozens of young girls. So that's the threat that we face. Just one of these people can commit a terrible crime. Jasmine, that's undeniable, isn't it? First of all, it's um, really, really difficult to hold an international tribunal to try ISIS fighters, because internationally, there's no one agreed-upon definition of terrorism. On the ISIS brides, I fundamentally disagree with this idea that we know that every single woman, many of whom were minors, who went to travel to Syria to join ISIS, were doing so because they wanted to commit crimes, to commit terrorist attacks, or in the case of Shemaima Begun, which I agree with Maser that she 
she actually was culpable, um, because they wanted to help recruit other women. Many of these women, and we know this both anecdotally and from intelligence, genuinely wanted to go live under an Islamic state. They were tired of being looked at as the other in Europe, tired of being looked at differently because they were wearing a hijab or a niqab, and they just wanted to practice a pious life. Now, once they got there, they realized that that was not what was happening, and a lot of them have since expressed a desire to come home. So let me put that point to Mesa. It's a very good point. Mesa, you made the point that if, if even one of them comes back, could be dangerous. Couldn't you turn that on its head? Not all of them are dangerous. If even one of them just made a mistake, was a young person, a teenager, wants to come home and fix their life and answer for whatever crimes they may be involved in, how can you be against that? That's true. Maybe, um, even if 90%, 95% of them want to return back to the UK and return back to their normal lives then uh, and won't present a risk, there is an argument that they could come back. But the truth is, it just takes one. But more importantly than that, what does that say about our country, that we allow these people to leave the UK, to leave, to Europe, uh, leave Europe, go to Syria to fight alongside the Islamic State that has devastated Syria and Iraq, killed thousands of young boys and men in ditches, and, and sold no thousands no of young girls. Denying those crimes, slavery, Mesa, but what does it say back. about the UK or the US that they would strip citizenship from these people? The UK has stripped citizenship from Shamima Begum uh, on the grounds that she is the daughter of Bangladeshi immigrants to the UK. That seems to a lot of people to be racist. You're not stripping citizenship from white ISIS fighters, only from the brown ones. Well, that's not true. There's a, uh, it hasn't been stripped of a citizenship yet, but there's one young man, um, so-called Jihadi Jack, Jack Letts. Um, he uh, is liable to have his citizenship removed, since he is also a citizen of Canada. Uh, it hasn't happened Shabima yet. Shamima Begum is not a citizen uh, of any other country. She's born and brought up in the UK. She's raised in the UK. She's a citizen of the UK. And shouldn't she therefore be tried in the UK under the rights that she has as a citizen? But under British law, you can have your citizenship removed if your parents are from a, uh, are from a but that's another my point. country. Or if your parents you... are from another country. But if your parents are not from another country, you can't have your citizenship removed. That is a double standard based on immigrant status. Many would say that's racist, Mesa. Well, it's British law. Just because it's British law doesn't make it really not do. racist. If I can just interject, um, no, um, Mezzi, if I can just interject racist. for a second, too, because disagree. I'd like to make a point. First of all, um, she, the, the UK foreign minister does want to strip her of citizenship because he says that she's a citizen of Bangladesh. Both, her, both her, herself and the government of Bangladesh has said she is not a citizen of Bangladesh. So effectively, she would be stripped of her citizenship, and we cannot render any person stateless. The second is that we cannot deny a person's right to return to their country of origin, which, as you know, Assad in Syria is doing to refugees who want to come home. It's against international law. It's against the Geneva Conventions. The other thing is that we have an obligation to um, follow the principles of humanity, and we have to act humanely in an armed what conflict. What do you say to those who say they made themselves stateless? A lot of these people burn their passports proudly. So that is such a good point, Mehdi. That is such an important point, because what a lot of people who are against the idea of repatriation are saying is exactly what you just said. These people um, revoked their own right to be citizens of our countries. They burned their passports. They left. They wanted to fight us and destroy our civilizations. Yes. That is what ISIS wanted to do. That is not what we do as Western states. That is not who we are. That is not who the United States is. It's not who the United Kingdom is. We don't abide by the standards that ISIS sets. We follow our own law. We follow international law. Because the worst thing to do right now is after working so hard and spending so much money, blood and treasure, to defeat ISIS militarily, is to give them that propaganda victory, that moral victory, to let them know that they may made us walk away from our morals Mesa. and our values. The only thing that I want to say is that she is currently in, she's lost her liberty. She's in a camp, a prison camp in northern Syria. Um, the British government has taken a view that she's a threat to the UK, that she has um, uh, Bangladeshi parents. Uh, citizenship in the UK is not an automatic right. Um, uh, you, uh, she has been stripped of her citizenship, and now she must return home to her, uh, to her family's country of origin. That doesn't make any sense. That is not her home, Mesa. You keep repeating it. What do you mean, Bangladesh is her home? It's not her country my of origin, though, Mesa. It's not India. her country of origin. If India was my point. home, Let I'd say you're a racist, then. Mesa. But that's not the, that's not the same. So in the in the United States, if you're born in the United in the U.S., you are a citizen of the U.S. If you're born in the U.K., 
Yeah, under British law, that doesn't automatically mean that you're a British citizen. Uh, in, instead, it says that you have a right to be a British citizen. And she this was, is just British and she law is a British I'm citizen until it was stripped. Jasmine, let me ask you this. The Danes talk about, quote unquote, de-radicalization. Are you saying that they should be brought back and rehabilitated or brought back and punished? It, I'm just saying they should be brought back and put under trial and determined whether they were actually criminal and a threat, in which case we should prosecute them to the fullest extent of our laws, or if they were deemed to be ideologically sort of um, straying and wanted to go to the Islamic State just to live under Islamic law, then they should be rehabilitated. My point, Mehdi, is an important one here, because I want to challenge the premise that we are allowing them to come back and just wander in the streets and hang out at Starbucks and pose a threat to our societies. That's not what I'm saying. These Western countries, including the UK, have the capabilities to bring them back, put them under trial, under criminal laws in those countries, which It hasn't exists. been that easy. They've only prosecuted, I think, 40 of the 400 people who have come back. It hasn't been easy to prosecute these people in the UK. That's, that's a fact. Okay, but what? It, it's not easy. It's not easy, but it's not. Imp it's not easy, but it's not impossible. Okay. We have laws on the books. The alternative to bringing them back and trying them, however difficult it is, is to let them stay in Syria and Iraq, potentially becoming more radicalized and posing a greater risk to us in the future in a place okay. where we can't control them or account for them. Already radicalized. Jasmine Al Gamal, Mesa Gifford. We'll have to leave it there. Thank you both for joining me on Upfront. That's our show. Upfront will be back next week.